Uh, welcome to this, the sixth lecture in the Introduction to Radar Systems course, and this lecture is going to focus on radar antennas. And we're going to start the first part of the lecture now. Well, now we're back to our block diagram that we see at the beginning of each lecture. And you can see that the focus uh, of this lecture is going to be on the antenna. And you can see that the antenna is the point where the electromagnetic energy leaves the radar and goes out into free space towards the targets that it wants to, to detect. And it's a very important part uh, of, the, of the radar, a very important subsystem. And if we go down and look at the radar equation for track and for search, we see that antenna properties come into play very strongly. The signal-to-noise ratio of the target is proportional to the gain of the antenna squared. That's a, its ability to call how well collimated the antenna beam, the antenna beam is, the electromagnetic beam. How well that beam is collimated, uh, we t how, how well we take the power of the transmitter and concentrate it in one direction. We'll go into a we'll explain to you what gain is. You can see that in the search equation, the area of the the effective area of the antenna comes into play. So they're very important uh, properties. The system noise temperature and the losses that are connected with the antenna also come into play in the radar equation, and they were treated in the radar equation lecture, and we discussed those uh, particular properties. But today we're going to focus on these properties which affect our radar performance in detail. Okay. So what is a radar and you know how is it defined? Well the IEEE which is the uh, Professional Society of Electrical Engineers defines the uh, antenna as the means for radiating and receiving radio waves and then, you know, that's quotes. Uh, and uh, a radiated electromagnetic wave I want to remind you those of you that aren't electrical engineers and haven't taken a lot of courses in electromagnetism. An electromagnetic wave consists of an electric and magnetic fields which jointly satisfy uh, the equations that Maxwell developed in the late 1800s. And, uh, and we're going to show you exactly how those electrical f electric and magnetic fields have to play. And, it, the, and notice it's a radiated electromagnetic field. And by that, it implicitly means that the energy in the, elect in the electric and magnetic field are propagating out in space. And electromagnetic energy is propagating out in space. And they satisfy Maxwell's equations, which are the physical laws governing all electromagnetism. Now, the antenna is the transitional structure between the, the, guide, the device that guides energy out of the transmitter. Uh, could be a cable, could be a waveguide and free space. So the antenna is that device. And here we see a visualization of the electromagnetic waves in a very simple antenna, a horn antenna. And we could have exciting uh, generating the electromagnetic wave, a source down here, typically a transmitter. And that could be uh, um, just a, uh, an accelerating charge. Uh, could be a, a charge on a on a, uh, a source that's going back and forth, oscillating, accelerating and decelerating charges, moving currents generate electromagnetic waves. And that wave will go down, uh, a metal guided wave, transition line. In this case, if the, the transmission line is a, a waveguide, it'll be, uh, be metal on the sides and the electric field vector, I'm showing you just now the electric field, the electric field vectors go and they go from one piece of metal to another, one piece of metal to another. And then you see this this section where the, the waveguide opens out and that's called a horn antenna. And the electric field vectors bend going from metal to metal and the energy is pushed out and when it's pushed out in the vacuum, the electromagnetic field lines have to go back onto themselves. And this is, shows you what they'd look like near the antenna. 
and the energy is pushed out of the antenna in a certain direction. And the nature of how it's pushed out is, is determined by the design of that antenna. And I'm going to show you different designs. If you're an electric electrical engineer, you know about electrical circuits, and we can model this whole, all the stuff on the left by a circuit where we have a voltage source and its um, impedance or resistance, and that generates a source, and we send down a transmission line, a standing wave, and then the antenna can be approximated by a couple of uh, resistances and a reactance. There's a certain amount of energy that um, we lose in the antenna as the electromagnetic wave goes through the antenna structure itself. The antenna heats up a little bit. And then there's the radiation that goes out. That R sub R represents the radiation that leaves. You'd like that to be most of the energy. And then there can be a little bit of energy. You want it to be a little bit that just hangs around and as part of satisfying Maxwell's equation stays around right near the antenna. And that's the symbol XA is the, react the reactants of that. So the antenna would be this part. If we were looking at it out in a, as an equivalent circuit, that's what it would be visualized by. Now, when we look at what the functions of the antenna are, they, there's about a half a dozen of them. As I said before, it's that transition point, the transducer between the transmitter and the free space. The next thing it does is it focuses the energy of the transmitter into a collimated beam so that you get lots of energy density on the target. We don't have energy going in all directions at once. In the introduction we showed you an isotropic antenna with the energy going everywhere equally likely. We want the energy focused where we want it to go on transmit so the power will get out to the target. Likewise, when we're listening after we've transmitted, we want the antenna to listen selectively at the angle where the energy is coming back from, that weak energy from the echo is coming back. So it also serves as the function of collecting very efficiently by having a well-collimated receive beam the energy from the echo. Okay? Another purpose of the antenna is to measure the angle where the targets that you see are located. If you have a very well-defined beam, think of it as a soda straw. And that would be a, a soda straw would be a very well-defined angular beam in both azimuth and elevation in both angles. And you point that soda straw in a certain direction, you can say, aha, you know you've made a measurement effect when you, you hear a target echo in your receiver you detect it, you know if the antenna was pointing in that direction that that's the direction of the target. So you're making um, a measurement of the azimuth and elevation that you can, depending upon the shape of the beam. If it's a shape like a soda straw, you'll get very good measurement in azimuth and elevation. Having that very good measurement in elevation and azimuth also allows you to resolve targets that are nearby an angle. If the, the targets are two or three soda straws apart or a couple of soda straws apart, you can, can resolve and say, gee, there are two targets near each other. So the antenna allows you to resolve targets also. It also has control, depending upon the number of soda straws that you have to transmit, so to speak, um, before you've looked at all the space you want to, it, it tells you how much you have to revisit space. It, 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 before you, it tells you how long it's going to take to go through and transmit and receive at all the different sp area of sp angle space that you want to put out energy and search for targets. Okay, so it can it performs all those different functions. And the antenna is this all these this collage of of uh, very pretty pictures show you that antennas come in all sorts of shapes and sizes. Uh, here's a Tradex antenna out at um, Kwajalein. It's a dish antenna. That dish is a parabola, and the energy comes out of the source here. And uh, here's a, 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 an antenna that looks like a, it's a, a hexagon, and, it, and that's made up of thousands of dipole antennas. 
and that, that, that antenna steers electronically rather than mechanically like this one. And here we see a close-up of the face of another phased array antenna. This is a phased array antenna. It, it steers via fa phase shifting. Here's a picture of that whole antenna. Then there are other antennas that are strips of circles. And here is a spiral antenna and another. They come in all shapes and sizes. The, if you fly out of, uh, in Boston area, Logan Airport, there are air traffic control antennas. And this antenna is rectangular shaped, not circular. And that means that its beam in elevation is much broader than its beam in azimuth. In fact, shaping goes on so that this antenna has a very wide beam, wider than the geometrical shape of the antenna would allude to. Uh, in, in elevation than in azimuth. Okay? So we're going to look at a lot of these different kinds. And also, if you look up here slowly, there are two antennas up here, two little parabolic uh, dish antennas that have feeds out at their focus. We're going to get into the properties of all those. What, 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 I just said that's sort of a big picture introduction I'm giving to you of what, the, what antennas look like. Okay. Now let's just go over the fundamental concepts of antennas. The first one I'm going to show you is that, um, and, and I'm taking the, probably the simplest antenna, and it's just a dipole. You have a, a, two wires coming out with an electric field between them, and then they go off at right angles for a quarter wavelength in one direction and a quarter wavelength of another. The total length of the, uh, of the uh, antenna that comes off perpendicular after the wire goes out. The total wavelength is a half a wavelength. It's a very efficient wave, way of transmitting, and it's called the dipole. And this is a simulation of uh, an electromagnetic wave coming out of a dipole. And areas of uh, high intensity are in red, and the lowest intensity in uh, blue, and in the in medium or in the, this greenish yellow. Um, and you see that the antenna has some directivity, maybe 80, 90 degrees. And it's a sinusoidal wave coming out. Just like you drop a pebble in a pond. And you'll see a wave go out, electromagnetic wave. Okay? And we're seeing that you drop a pebble in a pond, now we're repeating dropping the pebble in the pond. So you see it has a shape to it. A dipole has that shape. But also energy goes back with some energy. Less energy goes backwards. So there's going to be a real issue. How do we concentrate the energy? A dipole is a simple antenna, but it doesn't have a lot of directivity. How do we generate more directivity? It's an interesting question. And again, notice we're oscillating this, an oscillating source is driving this dipole. Okay. Okay, now let's focus on what is antenna gain. I've talked about collimating, you know. What do we mean by the gain of an antenna? Now, if we take a source that radiates in all directions equally likely, we call that an isotropic source. And if it was an electromagnetic wave that was emanating from that source, here we have uh, an ideal tower, and from it uh, just a source on top, emitting radiation in all directions. This would be an isotropic antenna. Isotropic means going in all directions. Most antennas are directional. They send their energy preferentially in one direction. And the am amount of energy that they send out, the power density that they send out, more in, in one preferred direction over that of the isotropic direction, the isotropic um, energy density, is what we call the gain. And here we see, in this case, and I'm going to explain to you how parabolic dish antennas work. We have a, a source, and the energy goes back to the parabola, and it is reflected out, and most of the energy goes out in one direction. Some goes and these little bumps we call side lobes. We'll talk about that later, and some goes off in other directions, but it's a lot less. And the amount of energy, uh, of radiation intensity, over what you get from an isotropic antenna is what we call the gain. The overall power is the same, 
the overall, you know, so many watts went out in all directions, equally likely. But a lot more watts went in this direction than went in other directions, even though the overall average power that the transmitter tr put out uh, is the same. And so the gain is the radiation intensity over that of an isotropic sphere. And, okay, now let's look at that dipole again. The exact equation for the gain of the dipole is this uh, uh, a trigonometric and algebraic expression that's a little complicated. But here we see is a, uh, in green, we have the, the isotropic antenna. And in red, we see the gain pattern of a dipole. And the dipole is located on the z-axis, up and down. Again, a quarter wavelength up and a quarter wavelength down. And there are a couple of ways we plot gain. Uh, we, we can plot it in a polar scale, where we take a slice, a vertical slice along the z, z say the z-x-axis, since it's symmetric, it doesn't matter as long as the slice is downward through Z. And this is what we see for the gain in red. And here we see, in this case, it's blue, the, the gain of the isotropic antenna. And we see that the gain, the maximum gain in natural units, is 1.64, is the gain of the, um, the power intensity over of the dipole over isotropic. And if we put that in logarithmic units, and the way we do that is we take that number, we take the logarithm to the base 10 and multiply it by 10, and that comes out to be 2.15, and so the gain in dB is 2.15 dBi, which means decibels over isotropic. If you forget what dBs are, you can go back to the first lecture where we defined what a decibel was. And we see here plotted, and in most of the plots you'll see in this lecture, we plot the gain in a logarithmic scale. This isn't in linear units. These are each two decades. This is, this is a factor of 10. So here we're up at 2.15 dB over isotropic is the center gain. And here would be in blue the gain of the uh, isotropic antenna, which is uniform over all angles. And here in angle, uh, this would be zero up at, on the z-axis, up straight up. This would be 90 degrees, and 180 degrees would be down the bottom. Okay? So this is, this, the purpose of this view graph is to get you comfortable with understanding what these plots are. We're going to see more of them later. Now, Let's go back to that parabolic dish antenna. Okay, uh, with a parabolic dish antenna, uh, it has the property that if you take energy, if we take a dish, dish, we take a reflector, and we shape it in the shape of a parabola. Excuse me, we 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 make it in the shape of a parabola, and that's just uh, the uh, the distance out this way is uh, the, the distance here squared. And you do that shape, y equals x squared. That's the shape of a parabola. If we make it in the shape of a parabola and put at the focus of that parabola a feed, then the electromagnetic energy will come out of the feed and go up in this direction, that direction, all these different directions. It'll hit the feed hit the, hit the uh, reflector, excuse me, and bounce back out, and it has the property that the, all the rays will go out parallel. Okay, and, and the path length from the feed to the dish and out to a point out here will all be the same. So the, the path length will all be the same, and all of the different rays will constructively, they'll all add up. And when you look out at far distances, you'll see an antenna pattern that looks like this. Okay? And this is for a diameter of the dish. Uh, if we looked at this dish, it'd be, it'd be circular. Uh, and this is a cross-section of the dish. 
the dish's diameter of 5 meters, a wavelength of 300 meters, excuse me, a frequency of 300 megahertz, and a wavelength of 1 meter. And for that, sh that uh, frequency antenna, we'd have a gain pattern as follows. We'd have a peak, it would be collimated, and the top of the antenna pa gain pattern we call the maximum gain. And that is, for this antenna, 24 dBi, or 24 dB above isotropic. Okay, that's over a hundred. Uh, 20, 20 dB would be a hundred. 4 dB would be, oh, like about three. So it's about 300 times the directivity, the gain of an isotropic antenna, approximately. Now, how wide is this beam? The way we characterize the width of the beam is we go down from the peak, 3 dB, and then we measure how wide the gain pattern is, and it's the half power, when you go down half power, that's 3 dB. It's the beam width, it's, width, it's the, the edge of the gain pattern to the edge of the gain pattern, right, left, when you go down 3 dB. And in this case, the half power beam width is 12 degrees. Now, as you go to the left and to the right in angle of the beam, we come down and we go where it seems to almost go to zero, and that's called a null. And then it goes up to and then down. And this bump here and here and here are called side lobes. They're places where we get local maxima of energy, but not at all anywhere near the energy that you want to have in your main lobe. What you'd like to do ideally is to have Mo just about all your energy up here in a relatively narrow beam and very, very little energy down here. And it has to do with how we design the antenna in the feed as to what we get for side lobes and structure. Now, what happens is, is that this feed sends out energy and some of the energy can, when we illuminate of the diameter out to here, some of it can go out to the edge and around the back. So we can even get energy all the way over at 90 degrees over here, but it's way down in, in, in amplitude. Okay, So we've, we've gone over what the side lobe is. The side lobe level is 18 dB, and that's from the peak to the top of the first side lobe. And the side lobe level is the distance from the peak of the first side lobe down to isotropic, 6 dBi. Okay, and you can see these two, the 18 and the 6, add up to the 24 dB, which is the whole size. Now let's move on and ask, well, how do I calculate what the gain is? And the gain is just 4 pi times the area of the antenna the effective area of the antenna divided by the wavelength of the radiation squared. And that's the gain of a parabola, a parabolic antenna. And the, be the rule of thumb in the best case is when you're very, very efficiently getting all your energy from your feed into the parabola and the effective area of the parabola is all of the area. If you put in what the diameter is, uh, pi d squared divided by 4, plop that all in, then uh, you see that the gain is pi d over lambda squared. Now, notice that the gain increases as the aperture becomes what we call electrically larger, that the diameter is a large number of wavelengths. That's about the key thing. When we have the diameter, a large number of wavelengths, we get a very, very, very well collimated beam. Now over here on the right, we're going to look at the effect of aperture size on the gain for a different number, for different wavelength antennas. And let's just look in this case, and we see as the frequency increases, as we go from 300 megahertz to 3 gigahertz, which is 3,000 megahertz, a factor of 10, we move up considerably 
from O22, 23 dB for a, say a six meter diameter dish. We move up to in the region of 40, 45 dB. We move up quite large. Okay. Now, to give you an example, which uh, is very poignant, here we have two antennas that are out at the Kwajalein Missile Range in the Marshall Islands. And uh, these antennas are radar antennas. And this antenna, the picture doesn't do it justice. This antenna is so big. Well, how big is so big? Would you believe 46 meters across? Okay. It we this antenna weighs 880,000 pounds, 440 tons. And it rotates uh, in azimuth on railroad tracks. <laughs> it's that big, okay? And it, is, it, it operates at a VHF, about 150, 160 megahertz. Now this other antenna over here has a 13.7 meter diameter dish under this radome. A radome is a structure that you use to uh, protect from the elements uh, an antenna, which structurally may be uh, delicate, and but it allows the electromagnetic energy to pass through it with very little loss. But and this just shows you the radome and in it at approximately that 13 centimeter diameter. Now you might think that this, because it's got a big diameter, it's going to have a big gain. But the fact is here, the wavelength is 1.8 meters, and this radar over here, MMW stands for millimeter wave. Its wavelength is 0 0.0086 meters, its frequency 35 gigahertz. The electrical, the diameter's electrical size is 25 wavelengths for this antenna, and that gives you a gain when you plug the numbers into 34 dB. But this antenna has an electrical size of almost 1,600 wavelengths, which a gain of 70 dB. Three and a half orders of magnitude, seven orders of magnitude. A 2.8 degree beam width, 0. 0.00076 degrees, like a thousandth of a degree, a, a little smaller than a thousandth of a degree. So it isn't the physical size of the antenna as much as the electrical diameter, the electrical size that makes really all the difference. Well, welcome back. Now we're going to start part two of lecture six in the Introduction to Radar Systems course. But before we move on, it just occurred to me as I was starting this, introdu this uh, introductory view graph that I mentioned in the introduction to the whole course that I'd be noting throughout the lectures the different people in that list and the acknowledgments and sort of putting an individual person with their really uh, great helpful contributions to the visuals uh, in each of the lectures. And so what I'd like to do is to just take uh, 30 seconds right now to go over and to not just have a list of names but put lectures with those names. Uh, Dr. Andy Gerber with the introduction view graphs, uh, Dr. Steve Wiener with the uh, radar equation, Dr. Bob Galish in the propagation effects, uh, Dr. Bob Atkins in the cross-section target, cross-section lectures, uh, Jim Ward in the detection lectures and in the signal processing lecture. I'm fully to blame for the clutter lecture, uh, Dr. Pamela Evans is uh, she gets kudos for a lot of great visuals that she developed that I'm using along with a number of mine in the antenna lecture and uh, Dr. Kathy Rink in the tracking and parameter estimation and then Jeff Hurd at transmitters and receivers. So that just quickly puts a name with the contributions of the different people. And as I said before, if uh, there's a problem, blame me. If you really love those visuals, you know, uh, give them the kudos. So uh, now we'll move on to part two. Polarization is defined by the orientation of the electric field vector as it propagates in time. And going back to early on, the early lecture, uh, the simplest electromagnetic wave is one where we have an electromagnetic field vector, 
and let's say this one goes up and down sinusoidally in the x direction and we know from Maxwell's equations the magnetic field vector is perpendicular to it and that's in blue and it's propagating out and if we just do a click you can see the the, the electromagnetic wave propagating out now polarization is defined as it's defined relative to the ground or to some other surface okay and most often it's defined relative to the ground okay when the electric field vector is vertical relative to the ground or perpendicular to the ground that's called vertical linear polarization and here we see this is linear polarization because if we look from the back of where we're transmitting the electric field vector goes up and down along a line it just goes up and down along a line it goes down down and up Let's see if I can do this it goes down up down up down up okay now and that's called vertical polarization and again with respect to the earth now why would we use that well it turns out that uh, over water uh, the backscatter from the sea which you don't want to see no pun intended is less at many frequencies with vertical polarization so you can help yourself when you if you don't want to see the, the background by transmitting at um, transmitting at vertical polarization with a um, if you're in a sea based radar on a ship say it also helps out with multipath under under conditions but if you're say uh, a radar that's looking upwards at aircraft and a big part of the scattering of aircraft are the wings and most of the time they're horizontal you'd like the electric field to be horizontal you'd like linear horizontal polarization okay now you can remember when we talked in the first lecture and um, and we talked in the, the lecture on uh, cross-section that the cross-section and the reflections that we get depend on the orientation of the electric field vector and if you go back to those simulations those uh, finite domain uh, simulations of an electromagnetic wave uh, hitting uh, a plate they, the, the properties of the leading edge and the uh, trailing edge diffraction which caused reflections back to the radar were different when the electric field vector was oriented differently that's because of the different polarizations so if you're back here just imagine an observer back here at the source of the radiation looking out you just the polarization you just look at how the electric field vector of the electromagnetic radiation if it's going up and down it's uh, linearly vertical if it's back and forth uh, excuse me it's vertical back and forth it's horizontal now there's another kind of polar a polarization that you can have where you have the electric field vector uh, and you want to you can mix together the polarization and you offset one by 90 degrees in phase and you end up with circular polarization and by that I mean the electric field vector uh, when you add the sum of those two electric fields that we made up uh, electromagnetic waves can be made up of superpositions of you can have two cross dipoles each emitting out of phase by 90 degrees you know and the, what the electric field that's transmitted will be the sum of the two electric fields and so the, the sum electric field that's transmitted will have a, a, a sum electric field vector that will rotate in space okay and if the amplitude of each electric field that's transmitted in the horizontal and the vertical are the same it, the electric field will go in a circle okay and it can be you go in a circle in one direction or the other and here we have that uh, a visualization of the electric field vector propagating out sort of like a slinky the, the tip of the electric field would follow the path of a slinky now if you're behind the vector you're behind again you're at the antenna looking out and 
the electric field vector goes in a clockwise direction. It's called right-handed circular polarization. And if it goes, the electric field vector goes in the opposite or counterclockwise direction, it goes, that's a left-handed circular polarization vector. Well, why would we want to do this? First, let's look at a pretty animation. Animations are always fun. Okay? So this is what, for right-handed circular polarization, the electric field vector would, that would be the electric field vector as a function of time, the total electric field vector. Okay? And that would be for right-handed circular. Now let's look at a left-handed circular polarization. Okay. okay. Now, why would one want to do this? Why would one want to do this? There are lots of times when you want to calculate when targets can have mixed properties. You don't know, like, whether an, a, a target that would be preferentially um, in, uh, would give off one kind of polarization or another, and so you might want to propagate both linear and horizontal at the same time. Are you, uh, there are uses that if you, uh, in many different radars where, where you can discriminate um, one kind of a target, one thing from another, and, uh, and, and rain mitigation is probably the best one. Uh, r rain, uh, you'll see in the lecture, then actually it's the next lecture, lecture seven, uh, where we discuss in detail uh, backscatter of all different kinds of unwanted targets, and one of them is rain. If you have a radar that's operating and it's raining outside, well, you're going to have backscatter from the rain and backscatter from, say, aircraft targets that, you're, that are of interest. Okay? Now, what is rain? It's spheres. Okay? And the mechani mechanism, as you'll see in the next lecture, of how the the, the rain scatters back as it refracts into the raindrop and it changes sign, um, it changes the, uh, if you transmit circular polarization of say right-handed circular polarization, as it re reflects in the raindrop and it comes back with the opposite sense of polarization. So if you set your antenna up to receive the same polarization that you transmitted then you don't see the rain. You mitigate the rain. If the raindrops are spherical, sometimes they're elliptical. I'll get into that in the next lecture, so maybe. But the point is, is that you'll mitigate the rain significantly if you transmit circular polarization and receive. Now, what about it, what, it, what happens with the targets? Most targets are a mix of linear uh, of scattering that's back that will come back uh, in each polarization. And so you'll get a mix of polarizations when you, from the target. And you, you, you'll, uh, you'll lose some a little bit, but you lose an awful lot of the rain. And so transmitting with circular polarization and setting up that receive mechanism that I talked about will help you in, uh, in a rain problem. Won't solve the whole problem. Doppler processing, which is lecture 8, is really the way to solve it. But um, it's one of the ways that circular polarization is used. Okay, now let's talk about the different field regions. One of the things that we talked about is that Maxwell's equations, uh, these four simple, beautiful equations that tie together electromagnetic fields, electric fields, magnetic fields, currents, and charges. And when we have radiation, Maxwell's equations have to be satisfied. Now, having studied Maxwell's equations, I think I've taken one, two, three, four, four or five full-year courses that were essentially Maxwell's equations. Um, from, from just in undergraduate and graduate school, let me tell you, solving Maxwell's equations to very simple things can be easy, and it, people make a lifetime of living solving Maxwell's equations. And when you take such complicated, they look theoretically beautiful, complicated equations, complicated situations that you want to solve, you have to make approximations. And you can, it turns out the solutions get to be real easy when you're very far away from the antenna. And that's when you want to do things like calculate the, the pattern of the antenna, the gain in directivity, 
polarization issues. You want to calculate the radar scattering cross-section. When you want to do all those things, when you're far, far away, when effectively the antenna appears to be like a point source, and what that really means is that the waves which come out from the antenna as spherical, by the time they get to you, those spheres can be very, very w superbly approximated as plane waves. Under those conditions, that's in the far, that's called the far field, and these, this is the algebraic condition when that's true. If the range is greater than twice the antenna size squared divided by the wavelength, then you're in the far field. And uh, this dude, Fraunhofer, he did a lot of the calculations. That's the far field region. And most of radar stuff that we worry about is uh, we deal with. All the powers radiated out there, we assume. The radiated field is a plane wave, I said before. When we get in close to the antenna, it's a lot more difficult. Near field equations are difficult. And here again, here's, I haven't had a picture before, but here's an idealized um, dipole as a simple antenna dimension D in the near field region. So the near field region is actually two different regions, a radiating near field region called the Fresnel region, which is between these two bounds. And when you're less than, uh, when the range to the top, up to the point in space that's of interest to you is less than 0.62 times the square root of d squared d cubed over lambda, then you're in the reactor near field region. That's called very close to the antenna. But so there are times when you need to do calculations in each of these regions. Uh, if you happen to have built an antenna that for one reason or another has grading lobes and you want to calculate the grading lobes nearby, say for uh, electromagnetic uh, health regions, you know, are the fields uh, uh, weak enough so that they're not a, a bother to, a, to, to human beings or creatures, you know, there are limits that the government sets. Then you need to do near field calculations, and that's a time when these calculations are done. Or if you're doing a, a calculations right near the antenna where you're calculating things like mutual impedance, you're in the reactive near field region sometimes. So you need to do calculations. They're a lot tougher. But for just about all the stuff we're going to be dealing with, it's called the far field. The reason for the, this view graph is to pretty much say to you, hey, there are three different regions. Most of the stuff we're going to be doing is in the far field. First, let's talk about the near field, the very near field. Now, with the antenna, um, you know the goal is to get out all of that energy as, and to make the the transmit transition between the waveguide and the uh, the free space as lossless as possible. And when we go from the feed to the antenna, it's not there's discontinuity there, and that discontinuity gives rise to a reflection. This gamma, this is a capital Greek letter gamma. It's a reflection coefficient, and if that gamma is zero, then the incident power is perfectly delivered to the antenna. If it's one, all of the incident radiation is reflected. And here we have uh, an equivalent circuit. We showed you that. There's the loss in the antenna, the radiation that goes out, and the, uh, the radiation, the reactants, it's stored in the antenna. And what happens is when it's reflected back is some of the energy um, if too much of it is reflected back to the antenna, from the antenna to the transmitter, all hell breaks loose because the transmitter can't stand it. You're sending out megawatts or tens of kilowatts of power. You send back 10% of that, and you've got real problems. The transmitters will shut down because big pieces of metal expect efficiency, and if they don't get it, they melt. So there's all sorts of safety devices in these transmitters to make sure, high power transmitters to make sure this doesn't happen. But it's a very important thing to design the antenna to maximize this power transfer from the transmission line. Now, it can be modeled, the antenna can be modeled as an impedance. And again, just to remind you, the impedance is the ratio of the voltage to the current at the feed point. Okay? Now, sometimes, and I don't have it on this view graph, a measure of how good that match is is called the standing wave ratio, VSWR, variable standing wave ratio. And when um, 
when uh, all of the power goes out, the standing wave ratio is 1. When all of the power is reflected, it's infinite. And the input impedance that you have here defines the frequency range over which your antenna can operate its bandwidth. Okay. Now I'd like to move on to reflector antennas in detail. I went over a little bit of this before. I probably uh, stole a little bit of my own thunder with a parabolic reflector antenna. Remember I said if you have the uh, feed at the focus, the path length from the focus where the source is reflecting off the parabolic surface and out to the wavefront is the same for all rays of energy coming out. So we have a fine wavefront here. What I'm going to focus on here is the issue of the, the trade-offs that go on and how you design where you put the antenna. Well, you have to put the antenna pretty much at the focus. You have a little bit of leeway one way or the other, but how you design this feed. okay? Because if we make the feed too big, some of the energy will spill over and we won't efficiently um, have the en energy reflect off the parabola and go out. And if I have uh, the, the energy focus too narrow, then the effective diameter of my antenna won't be that big. I, w I would like to see uniform illumination of the whole parabola and then none afterwards. And that assumes things you just can't do in a feed very well. You can taper the illumination of the feed. That can help out. But anyway, for a realistic antenna, there are all these different areas. And I'm just going to go over them for a minute. We've got the main lobe at zero degrees, straight out here on axis. And then this is a little, it doesn't have a minimum before the side lobe, but it's called a vestigial lobe, a shoulder. And, but when you go, you, know, you go down to a null and then up, we call that the first side lobe. And then we see the side lobes get increasingly down lower and lower. And when we have a real, this is a null, not a local minimum, but it's a real null down there. And then we have some radiation out a little after 90 degrees, which spills over. So when the angle is over here, some of the radiation from the feed leaked over here, and it's down in the side lobe region, below the first side lobe. And we can even get energy that leaks and diffracts back around the back. So we can even have some energy, albeit it's down 40 dB, that's 10,000 times down from the peak but we can have some energy, and that's called, go all the way around the back, and that's called the back lobe. So the f design of the feed is a very important thing. Now, one of the ways that we, um, uh, issues that we can have with the parabolic feed are that you have to take waveguide or cable, and it has you have to have that feed. When you saw that feed with a, the parabola, it was sort of hanging there in space, and it just doesn't hang there in space. Let's just go back for a minute. You know, that feed just doesn't hang there in space. You have to have some struts from the antenna holding it up, and they're going to block some of the energy going out, so you're going to have a loss and gain from that. Then you're going to have to have a feed that's going to take the energy from the transmitter and loop it around behind. And that, and you're going to, if it's a heavy feed, you're going to have to have structure to hold it. So you're going to have blockage issues. There's another design, rather than a simple parabolic antenna, that you can use to mitigate some of these problems, and that's called a Cassegrain reflector antenna. If there are any of you out there that are, uh, deal with uh, telescopes, Cassegrain is one of the uh, optical uh, designs that telescopes are. Now there's a Gregorian design, which I won't get into in this lecture at this detail. But anyway, what you do is you have your para parabola, and here's our where we put the feed if we were if we were going to use a parabolic feed. But if we take and we put a hyperbola, which is another geometric shape relative to this. Uh, focal point, we put a hyperbola, then what happens is, and then I put at the focus, at the real focus, I put the feed back here, then what will happen 
this is the focus of the uh, hyperbola, then what will happen is the rays coming out from effectively just the back of the parabola's dish will go out and hit this parabolic, what we call a subreflector, and then we'll go back, reflect out again to the dish, and we'll all go out parallel, all with the same path length from the feed, and everything's copacetic. Now what have we done, and what have we gained? We don't have a big structure that's going out and around with the feed, and we, we have a lot less blockage, so we're able to get better, get a more efficient antenna, more, more gain. Okay, and that's a Cassegrain feed. One thing I didn't point I didn't point out is that at um, very high frequencies, uh, the loss for a hundred feet of waveguide at say uh, ten at, at uh, three centimeters can be as much as seven or eight dB if you have a hundred feet of waveguide, and at uh, uh, say L band, which is twenty three centimeters, it can go down to the order of a, less than a degree, a less than a dB per 100 feet of waveguide. So the attenuation that you have in the waveguide can be a uh, significant factor in wanting to choose a Cassegrain feed. Okay? Now what do these guys look like? Well, Altair is a good example of an antenna that has a Cassegrain feed mode. But this is a dual frequency antenna. It, it, ha it transmits at two frequencies. It's, uh, it transmits at UHF with a Cassegrain feed, a feed back here. Uh, there's the horn, the Cassegrain horn, which goes out to a subreflector here, and then back to the parabola and out. But back here, it's got a, another feed for VHF. Well, you say, gee, doesn't this uh, subreflector get in the way. Well, it's made with a frequency selective surface. Think of it as um, it's, it's a metal plate with holes in it that are designed to let VHF energy through but to reflect UHF energy. I mean, this is a powerful antenna. It's uh, peak powers in megawatts. So it's a very carefully designed, this frequency selective surface, you know, is not for children to design. <laughs> There's an art form designing these at high power. Uh, and uh, consequently, but that to this particular antenna, 45.7 meters across, 880,000 pounds, 440 tons, it uses both a parabolic and Cassegrain uh, feeds. It's an interesting example for you to see. Okay, now it's time to start part three in the radar antenna lecture in the introduction to radar systems course. Okay, now let's move on to phased array antennas. Okay, what are phased array antennas? Well, first of all, uh, let's look at these gain patterns. And these gain patterns are in dB on the uh, y axis as a function of angle. And we have a, let's say we have an isotropic element. It's uh, uniform across all. Now, say for instance we take an array of elements. It could be isotropic or could have a little bit of directionality like a dipole. And we combine them. And we just combine them. And remember what we did when we, uh, well, we'll see in a minute when we combine them what happens. What happens is that the phases, the amplitude and phase of this radiation will constructively and destructively interfere with its neighbors. And what you'll get for a gain pattern when the, we just sum them, we just add them together, is we get a gain pattern that has a maximum in the center. And I'll just say as a caveat that the distance between these antenna, these little elements, we'll call them, elements of an array antenna, this distance is uh, less than half of the wavelength of the energy we're radiating. Uh, and what we get is one big bump. If we take, let's say they're half a wavelength apart. 
So we've got like a wavelength and a, uh, a wave, a, a total of a wavelength here. And then we move the, uh, here we have one, two, three, four, five, two and a half wavelengths they are. You see that the, the width of the beam gets narrower and the gain gets higher. This is relative response. When we take, so what happens is when we add them all up, we get, if we add the gain from three, we get more gain and we get some directivity broadside when we're looking straight out. If we just add them and we add more, we get a lot more gain and a lot more directivity and notice the side lobes go down. Now, if we, we can adjust the phase of these different elements, the emissions from these elements, so that at one point in space, one angle away, they all add up constructively and we get the same constructive interference which gives us good directivity and narrow beam width at a different direction. If we appropriately shift the phase of all these different elements. Now what if we could do that very, very, very quickly? We could change the direction that the antenna was pointing very quickly. Now I'm going to steal my own thunder. People decades ago invented ferrite phase shifters that could shift phase at high power in microseconds. M imagine that big antenna that we just, I'll go back to it for a minute. That big antenna. Say it's pointing up in space in one direction. You want it to move that antenna 30 degrees or 20 degrees over in space. Big motors. You can imagine the inertia in that antenna to do that. Enormous job enormous job. But if I could have this antenna face be a whole raft of, a whole face of elements, and I could just change the phases in microseconds, that beam could be pointing over in another direction microseconds later. And that could allow me to flip back and forth the beam. Okay, That's a neat idea. And that's been, a, we're able to do that with today's technology, and that's called phased array antenna. Okay, now let's show see how the phasing works for the constructive interference and destructive interference. Here, for just for simplicity's sake, we're going to take the two dipoles separated by many wavelengths, and we're going to have them transmit. And remember, red is where they're constructively interfering. Here's the main beam. And what you see is the main beam, and then a minimum, and then a maximum, and another. And so we see side lobes that are pretty sizable, by the way. And this is a, a typical interference pattern. Now, if I move, these, these are called grating lobes. If I move these dipoles close together, which I haven't done in the animation, and I move them real close together, like about half a wavelength or less, approximately half a wavelength, those grating lobes will disappear and I'll just see one main beam. And if I had a whole row of dipoles and I shifted the phase, that one main beam here, I could get it to point just one beam in that one direction only. And that's what phased arrays are and how they work. So let's look, about, look, look at controlling arrays yeah, and how the array uh, controlling the phase on the different elements allows us to keep the wave front so they constructively appear. So let's just say we have um, an element, n element separated each a distance d from each other, and is a wavelength lambda involved in here. And we can see, now if I want the, the radiation to all be in phase at a certain scan angle, then what I have to do is adjust the phase. I can set arbitrary phase, say the first one, but I have to set the phase of all the remaining elements such that I have a maximum out in the far field along a line, along that plane wave in the far field. 
Okay? So that's what I need to do is make those phase adjustments. And as I've said, we now have technology that allows us to make those phase shifts electronically. Just go switch. A few microseconds later, the phase is a shift. And where the antenna is electrically pointing to receive or to transmit has been changed. Change it again. Microseconds, it's pointing in another direction. Okay. So we have lots of different geometric configurations we can make these phased array radars. We can, for the elements, we can set them along a line rectangularly in circular grids. And there's a whole book written, a lot, couple of different books written on how you design phased array radars. There were, another parameter to deal with is the element separation, the phase shifts, the amplitudes, the, how we amplitude uh, modulate uh, the uh, as we go down the array that will control the side lobes and the pattern of the individual elements are they dipoles or are they isotropic elements or special design all these parameters will go into the the uh, design of the exact performance and directivity and side lobe level of a phase array radar but we're just going to go into some of the basics here. Okay. First of all, let's look at a linear array, just along a line. We'll worry about two dimensions later in the end. Now, first what we have here are ten elements, all in the z-axis, vertically. And we have here is the uh, shape of the main beam and the side lobes. And here we have, and this here we show this would be on a linear scale, but right up here is on a dB scale where you see the side lobes. And you can see the, the side lobes, the, the gain is this is 10 dB above isotropic. And zero is the, uh, this is the gain above isotropic. We have 10 elements. So the elements all add up constructively. If we make, and, and for this case we're looking at lambda over 2 separation, that is the spacing between elements is a half a wavelength. We're doing no phase shifting at all. And we just got isotropic elements. They, each element um, transmits isotropically in all directions. And when we look out perpendicular to the line of the array, that's called a broadside array. This is a linear broadside array. We're going to look at in, what happens when we increase the number of elements in the array. We get as we double the number, we get double the gain. 13 dB is double 10 dB. And we double it again to 40 elements, we get 16 dB. And notice the side lobe level at, in, way down in the lower side lobes goes down. So the gain for a long broadside array is twice the number of elements times the spacing divided by lambda. And if d is lambda over 2, then the gain is just the number of elements. Simple. Long linear elements, 10 elements. Just take the uh, it's factor of 10 is the gain. Uh, logarithm to the base 10 of 20 is 2 times 10. Excuse me, is 1.3 times 10 is 13 dB. And the same here. The logarithm to the base 10 of 40 is 1.6 times 10 is 16 dBi. So you can see just that's the gain. Okay. Now let's move on. For, again for a broadside away, array and let's look and see what happens if we change the separation. If we make the separation lambda over 4 we just get a gain of 7 dB above isotropic. And if we get a gain, if we separate them lambda over 2 we get the full gain of uh, 10 dB. But if we separate them more than lambda over 2, in this case, if we separate them a wavelength, so-called grading lobes appear. And that means that significant amount of energy is received at angles other than the beam, the angle we want to point at. In this case, directly, we're looking broadside. We're just looking broadside. But we'll receive energy out at 0 degrees and 180 degrees from it. So we'll receive energy with equal sensitivity here and here with 
uh, separation of lambda. We don't want grading lobes. Grading lobes are a no-no. Okay, so it, to limit for a broadside array to limit element separation to less than lambda will prevent grading lobes. Now, if we look at an end fire array, and an end fire array is one where it's a uh, where our main direction that we're looking is along the direction of the of the uh, elements. And that's called an end fire array. For, so for an end fire array, and it's phase shifted, we've already got the phase shifters shifted so the beam will point up. And now we say, what does the gain pattern look like for this end fire array for 10 elements? In each case, it's just 10 elements. For lambda over 2 separation, excuse me, for lambda over 4 separation, we see uh, we've got a decent beam at 0 degrees. At lambda over 2 separation, the grading lobes appear. And at lambda separation, grading lobes appear. So when we're operating a, an, an array in n-fire mode, then we need the separation. Uh, there are no grading lobes for separations between d and lambda over 2. And the gain is 2L over lambda for a long n fired array without grading lobes. Okay. So if we have a linear phased array, what happens when we scan? We haven't looked at We've just been looking at all those previous patterns and when we were looking just broadside. What happens if we set the phasers up to point the beam off of broadside with a broadside array? Well, first of all, here's a, let's say, broadside let's, is Here's our set of elements, and right here, uh, relative to the vertical, we want we will, the broadside di direction would be out this way, which would be 90 degrees. So here's that broadside um, gain pattern, and we see it's all nice and fine. We've got a nice, well-defined beam, reasonable side lobes. If we shift it out 30 degrees to the angle, we see that the broad beam, the beam broadens. And if we shift it out 150 degrees, broadens even more. And if we shift it out 90 degrees, we get um, it shifts, it broadens a lot. So the beam width increases as we scan off broadside. So to keep to scan over all space without grading lobe, we want to keep the element separation. At uh, between at less than lambda over two, that's an important thing. Okay, and for this is a case where we scanned every 30 degrees with 15 elements, and the separation was lambda over four. But the bottom line here is, don't make your separation elements greater than lambda over two, if for all all space you don't want to see grading. Now, this broadening is a, an important factor, and you lose resolution. So a lot of the time, people don't want to scan more than 45 degrees because they don't want the, the, the lose angular resolution. And that will allow you to go like uh, 0.7 lambda. You know, you know, not lambda over 2, but 0.7 lambda for your spacing. Okay? Now, one, over th one other thing I want to point out is that the gain drops with the cosine of your broadening angle. Now, like, the gain goes down uh, with the cosine of your beam off of broadside, and the beam width increases uh, by when it would be your baseline beam width divided by the cosine of the angle that you're off of broadside. That's a little, little tidbit I'll add in. Now, what do you do with planar arrays? Well, Ah, oh, here we have it right here. Excuse me. Um, with planar arrays, it's just adding another dimension. A planar array is just an array of linear arrays. And here is um, the pattern you get in three dimensions with um, spacing of lambda over 2 and with five elements. And as we scan off a broadside, say, theta 0, as I just said, the beam width broadens by 1 over cosine of the scan angle, and the directivity, the gain, decreases by the cosine of that scan angle. And again, 
for a plane or phased array to scan over all space without grading lobes, keep the element spacing separation in both directions less than lambda rho over 2. And my rule of thumb when I'm thinking about designing antennas, because of that broadening effect, you can get away with 0.7 lambda when I do my DN radar phased array designs, because in, you don't want to suffer the kind of beam broadening and directivity decreasing if you go out more than 45 or 50 degrees. That's a trade-off in the radar system's design. Though. This whole business of what happens when we take a, a set of elements and put them along a line all assumes that, we, that one element, what we, that the effects that we see in, in the far field and in the near field and everywhere, one doesn't affect another and how we design that antenna. Is the, 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 what the patterns of each element are independent of any other elements nearby. And that's not true, because Maxwell's equations have to be satisfied everywhere. And as the uh, an element is generating on the surface, on that dipole currents, those currents generate fields nearby and induce currents on nearby elements that are like lambda over two apart. So the coupling that they have between one and another, they don't act completely independently. And that's a near field um, entity. It affects one another. And the design of the pattern is, uh, is such that you can't, you have to take these mutual coupling effects into account. And it has an effect on the input impedance that the system sees. And it also depends on scan angle because you can understand that as you scan the antenna so the radiation is pointing more in one direction than in another, then it's going to affect the currents that are induced in the nearby antennas. So the in impedance effects are going to depend on how you scan. The mutual coupling effects are going to... So this is a complicated... I like to say this is something that's uh, really, if you go to uh, many of the uh, solid uh, introduction to uh, Merrill Skolnick's introduction to radar systems book. Uh, even for those, it's it's we don't completely understand mutual coupling. It is an art form. Uh, you can get mutual coupling in antennas that uh, some people say you can get a scan blindness when no no power is radiated. You can see this physic when you do the design with modeling, but you know when you go you, you know there's, there's modeling and. and, and the models and, and the analytical calculations are always based on the reality, you know, and then you go measure it and you get different things. This is what people, uh, professionals, the antenna designers, write professional papers on these days. The point I want to make to you newbies to the, uh, the world of radar and the antennas and phased array antennas, so mutual coupling is an effect that's, that you have to take into account. The expert radar designers will. It can limit the scan volume and the array bandwidth. And it, it sometimes can be employed, exploited to uh, get uh, performance requirements, to achieve certain requirements. And one element doesn't act in independence of another. And for the relative neophyte to the radar world, that's the important thing you need to take away from this last minute or two of uh, understand how view graph and words. Okay, now I've talked about phased arrays, I've talked about reflectors. Ah, uh, what do you do? You know, look, if you've got uh, uh, the job to track one target up in space, you want relatively high power on it, a dish antenna is usually the way to go. You don't need a phased array. You know, and there is some, and you can get away with the lowest cost. If you've got an operational requirement where you have to track a lot of targets simultaneously at a lot of different angles, you're either going to have to buy a lot of dish radars, you know, because they can't go back and forth mechanically that fast, you're going to have to build phased arrays or use other, I haven't gone into other uh, modes of scanning other than phased arrays and reflectors. There are uh, antennas that scan with frequency shifting, which is another topic, not of the, don't have the time in this lecture to go into that. But, but phased arrays, to, to contrast phased arrays and reflectors, 
They provide beam agility and reflect and, and flexibility. You can do multiple functions. You can do you can have a set of beams that are doing surveillance down at the horizon. And at the same time you're tracking targets way above the horizon. So you can do near simultaneous tracks over a wide field of view. Um, the next bullet, major bullet, gets into it. It's expensive. It's more expensive to build a phased array with the same power aperture product as a reflector. But if you, and if you need 360 degree coverage, you may need three or four filled array faces to cover that. Because I mentioned, you, you, you know, you can't scan the phased array 180 degrees and have two of them back to back because you'll have uh, scan losses and the beam shapes will be very poor out at the wide angles. So you're going to have to have multiple phased arrays to cover three or four filled arrays to cover 360 degree coverage. There's a larger component cost. Uh, I alluded to earlier, no, not yet, it's in a later lecture, in the transmitter lecture, and you'll see that the cost per element um, can be quite high when you add up uh, getting the same power aperture product out of it one big transmitter versus a lot of transmit receive modules or phase or a big phase array antenna. So it can be larger costs and they can they're significantly more expensive they can be. And it can be a longer design time too. Um, dish antennas are much more off the shelf and, and much easier to build from an engineering point of view. But many requirements uh, uh, that the government have uh, require the, the, the technology that are within phased arrays, and thank God we have them, are able to perform uh, very complex missions that, that some different uh, radars require. It's a trade-off, as they say. Okay, now to summarize. I covered an awful lot of material, and I'll probably be breaking this up into three pieces, not just two. Uh, okay. Now, uh, in summary, we've talked about antennas, fundamental antenna parameters, and of array antennas. The topics we've d discussed are the radiation gain, pattern, side lobes, bandwidth, polarization. We've talked about the different, the far field, a little bit about the near field too, input impedance, how we form beams with arrays. We talked about mutual coupling. For reflective antennas, we talked about parabolic feeds and Cassegrain feeds as relatively expensive ways to get high gain on an antenna. An antenna that wants to look generally at one time at one place in space and that can very slowly go over and then scan, with a mechanical scan, relatively slowly, go over and look at another place in space. Um, and phased array offer the beam agility and flexibility, but they're much more expensive than a reflector antenna. And as I mentioned also, there are Different, there are other kinds of antennas that use uh, frequency shifting to uh, do scanning. And then radars also can be hybrids of phased arrays, where you can uh, have phased arrays for one dimension and mechanical scanning in another direction, or frequency scanning in one dimension and mechanical scanning in another. So you can build hybrids of them. And um, so there, and that, so what I want to just let you know in, in ending is that it's a very rich topic that we probably could spend uh, double the time we've spent on it and this gives you the basics and you know it, do, it does more I hope than scratch the surface but gives you those basics so that you understand the basic concept of antennas that are used in radars. Thank you very much. Hello, now we'll start part two of the uh, radar antenna lecture, and that's lecture six, in the Introduction to Radar Systems course. Okay, now it's time to start part three in the radar antenna lecture in the Introduction to Radar Systems course. <coughs> 